Christ. So have you ever anticipated something so much that you really over-anticipated it? Seems kind of strange, right? What, is, what, what am I talking about here? You know, you think about it and you're, you're planning and you get so many ideas in your minds that you think it's going to turn out a particular way and then it turns out it doesn't. Have you been in that kind of situation? Okay? Or you get worried about things and you're worried about everything. Okay? I want to tell you a story about when my wife and I went to a, a weekend called engage, uh, Marriage Encounter. How many of you have been to a, a Marriage Encounter? What do you guys remember about it? At least I'm not hearing what I heard this morning. Somebody said, I got a divorce after it. it was, <laughs> was, it's like, uh, that, 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 that was over-anticipating. No, what I remember was cramps. Because if you've been on one of those weekends, you do a lot of writing. And my hand doesn't like to write. If you've seen my handwriting, um, it's not pretty. And my poor wife had to endure all that I wrote that weekend, as sloppy as it was. But when we were doing that weekend, it was the eighth and a half month that we were pregnant with my son. You remember how you sat in that weekend? You remember how you feel when you're that far along? Yeah. She wanted to do it, so I couldn't be blamed on that one. But we were very pregnant, and we spent a lot of time sitting on the floor, which was just so much fun lifting her up every week. I was such a kind and considerate husband that weekend. But she was, one of the things, you know, in, in the opening introductions that she said she was worried about was that in case she actually had to give birth. And, you know, we hoped somebody could help out if we needed it, because I wasn't an EMT then, so I didn't know about all those things. Um, and so we went through the weekend, and we did all the fun stuff, and it was a great time. And if you haven't been on it, I encourage you to do. Um, but at one of the last things they do then is finally introduce the couples. Now, there's been a couple, three couples who are leading you the whole time. And they will tell you who they are, but they won't tell you anything about themselves. Finally, at the end, they kind of let you know so that you can just know them and listen to what they're saying rather than you know, have preconceived things. Like, as soon as the guy and the wife introduced themselves as a pastor and his wife, I already knew where they were at, and I had preconceived notions about it, which was kind of fun because they weren't anywhere close to what they were. Another couple told us who they were, and the third couple gets up, and the husband announces his name and what he does and all that stuff, and then the wife gets up, and she looks right at us, and she goes, and I'm a nurse, and I work in the OB section. My wife kind of said, now she tells me that. <laughs> but the fun part is that whenever we get worried about some of those kinds of things and we start getting overly excited and, and anticipating and, and trying to work through all of that, we find out that God oftentimes does things better than we could ever plan. And in essence, that's kind of what's starting to happen in the gospel lesson. Look at it again. It's Jesus' first miracle. The miracle of the wedding at, the Cana, at Cana. And everything starts off pretty cool. It identifies. On the third day, a wedding took place at Cana in Galilee. Now, reading it out of context, the third day means absolutely nothing, right? But what's the context? What happened in John chapter 1? Okay, in the verses immediately preceding it, Jesus had just started um, calling out his disciples. He was introduced... Uh, by John the Baptist says, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And then he uh, gathers his disciples. He starts with Andrew and Peter and then Nathaniel and Philip. And we begin to see the group starting to build. And so now they are all going to a wedding. And we really know nothing about whose wedding it was, what they were. We don't know if they were friends, and relative, friends or relatives of Jesus. We just know he was there. And really all those details really don't matter when all is said and done. But he goes there. And things are going along. And, and weddings at those times were kind of fun things like they can be today. But um, they were a little longer than what we have now. They tended to be almost a week long in celebration. And they would gather each night at the, at the, the bride and groom's house. They never went on a honeymoon. They stayed home. And you would gather there and you celebrate them. And they would treat them like royalty. 
And they would have banquets and, you know, it was, they were even addressed some, sometimes as like the king and queen of the house now. Just to kind of let them enjoy everything. Well, as things progressed, they uh, ran out of a major thing, wine. Major food staple of the day. And Mary, Jesus' mother, had to have some connection to this couple. We don't know what. All kinds of theories and stories, and it really doesn't matter. But she comes to Jesus and she said, hey, they're running out of wine. Do something about it. It's kind of her translation. You know, she has this expectation. And put, it, put yourself in her place. Because I can kind of start understanding. Because what has she been doing for 30 years? Waiting. She's announced by the angel that she's pregnant. And she is going to be conceiving the Emmanuel. God with us. The Messiah. And the shepherds come and tell her all this stuff. The wise men show up. And they tell her. She's been at the temple where she's give, giving Jesus a dedication. And Simeon is there. And he's praising her and blessing her. And then he says, and the sword will pierce your heart also. And so she's hearing all of this stuff. And for 30 years she's been waiting for her son to do something. There's a bad comment I could make in there, but I won't. So I'll be good. She's just been moving on and waiting for her son to do something. And now he finally is. He's begun to gathering his disciples. He's starting off on this early part of his journey in ministry. And she now says, okay, show forth. I think in her mind she was looking for some big thing for him to do. Because she knew who he was. She knew he was God. And so God deals in big things. In Jewish understanding, when they saw God do things, they saw big things. All right? Think about some of the big things that he did. The Passover celebration. Going through and killing all the firstborn in Egypt. That's a big thing. The crossing the Red Sea on dry land is a big thing. The feeding of all the people. The destruction uh, of, of some of the uh, Jer uh, Jericho as they begin to get into the promised land. You know, those are the stories that they see with God and they see big things. And I think that's a part of where her mind was at. That she was expecting big things out of her son. Because he was God. And you have to be careful when you read some of these things. Because in this case, it can be very easily read what Jesus says is what? Dear woman, why do you involve me? My time has not yet come. And kind of read it in a sarcastic tone. Because it would be very easy for us to hear Jesus saying that. Except that I don't think he did. I think he did it in more of a loving way that basically said, I got it under control, don't worry. Don't force things. I'll take care of it. And what does he do? Well, she trusts in him. He's going to do it. Tells the servants, do whatever he says. And what does he do? Think about what did he do? He turned water into wine, right? But did he do anything? You didn't hear of any fancy, you know, abracadabra, hocus pocus kind of stuff. He just said, take some water. Take that, draw from that thing, take it over to the guy. And that was it. And by the time it gets to the guy, it's wine. It was a very small thing when you think right about it. And yet, it was more they could never expected. Because how many of you would really want between 120 and 180 gallons of wine? You're honest. <laughs> she raises her hand. <laughs> That's an awful lot of wine to have at a party. Isn't it? Okay. Huh? Huh? Yeah. Even though it's a big thing for them, it's still an awful lot of wine. And who saw it? The servants? The mother? The disciples? And that's about it. I don't think anybody else saw what happened. The wine steward, the master of the banquet, he didn't know where it came from. It says that. 
He didn't know where it came from. He just tasted it. And what does he say? This is the good stuff. And he kind of has this real shock because what do we tend to do? You bring out the good stuff. You let everybody's palate get a little bit um, something. And then you bring out the bad stuff when they don't realize what's going on. You know, then you bring out the chief stuff. No, this is all backwards. He brought out the best stuff later in the celebration. And in a sense, that's exactly what Jesus is all about. Because by the time he is done and risen from the grave, everything is upside down and inside out. It's just opposite of what you would expect. But it really was relatively low-key and yet abundant. You know, when you think right down to it, that's the way it starts off with Jesus. Generally, our relationship with him doesn't start off with a big, you know, Paul-like experience where you're walking along and you have that um, voice from heaven and the bright sunlight all around you and you get blinded and, you know, that kind of moment. How do most of us really get started? We get started very simply. Somebody introduces us and talks to us about the love of God. Or we come with a hurt or a need or a desire and we start to move forward. Because he starts with us like he did his disciples. Yeah, he had his disciples. He had the group of people who were willing to follow him. But did they really know he, who he was yet? I know Andrew probably didn't. Because Andrew was actually one of John the Baptist's disciples. And when John said, him, Andrew went to him. And probably really didn't understand who he was yet. And part of this miracle was nothing more than to let the disciples begin to know what and who Jesus really was in a very small and understanding way. And really that's the way he starts with each of us. He starts with us small. And he begins to meet those little needs that we have. And he begins to help us understand that we have a bigger need that we don't even realize. A need of salvation and of hope and forgiveness. And he gives that to us. And he has it there ready for us. But we need to begin just understanding who he is and what he is. And it's those little things that begin to help us understand and build our relationship. You see, part of this whole epiphany season is to get to know who Jesus is and let him begin to shine among us. And that's our constant challenge, to letting him in, to letting him see what's going on. Because God has great plans for us, but sometimes we don't know what they are. How many of us know exactly what God has in plan for us? Every time I thought I knew, I think he laughed at me and said, let me show you in my time and in my way. And things would happen that I didn't anticipate. But yet, he's always there. In the midst of everything I've gone through, my God has been there. And he's dwelt with me and said, walk with me. I'll show you the way. And that's what he wants us to do, to walk with him, to let begin that relationship and that understanding. And how do we get to know who Jesus is? Back into the word. To make it part of our daily devotional life. To make sure you're reading. You know, I have to admit that sometimes it's tough reading God's Word. I've uh, challenged myself again to start reading through the whole Bible, and in January I started. I've gotten myself up to uh, Exodus, and, you know, I've seen the big thing, and now I was just finished the book of Exodus, and it kind of ends with some rather um, not all that inspiring stuff. It's talking about how they built the tabernacle and they built the Ark of the Covenant and the chairs and the whatever else and how they were inlaid with gold. And they're all nice and beautiful, but they're not all that exciting, you know. And yet, I read it and I finished it. And Friday night I go to a meeting and a guy stands up and he's given his, his talk and, and his devotion. And he brings back part of that story. He talks about the two guys who were given the gifts, to be able to, to, to inlay the gold on top of everything. And, and, how, and the way he went through his devotion, and I'm sitting there going, I just read that. 
I didn't see it that way. Wow, that's kind of cool. And that's the way he works with us. He'll work with us and start to get us to move and see things differently. And it might be a new way of understanding. And he wants us to be involved in his word. But he wants us to talk to him in prayer. That's part of our de devotional life is to take time and pray with him. And just to let that conversation flow back and forth with him. So that we can tell him our needs and our desires. And he kind of looks back and sometimes he laughs at us and says, no, I got something better. Or sometimes he takes care of us, but he continues to move us forward. And then he strengthens us in the sacrament as we eat and drink his bread and, and wine in the form uh, with and under his bread. Ah, I can't even say it now. The bread and wine with the body and blood of Christ as he puts us there. He is there strengthening us and encouraging us and giving us the strength to move forward and grow. That's what he wants us to do. Be people who are ready to grow. So as we continue throughout this whole church year, through this epiphany season, let the light of Christ dwell in you rich richly in everything that you do. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Now may, the, now may this, may he strengthen and keep you in everything. Amen. We continue now.